for me, but um, I worked with Jeff and Theo on the book that we're launching tonight, um, Secret Life. So I wanted to talk a little bit about that. Um, I remember sometime in 2013 when I heard about the rollout of the three Southern Reach novels. It must have been industry news or maybe it was in the FSG catalog. Um, FSG is Jeff's publisher, his novel publisher, and Dean Q is distributed by FSG in the US. So at the time, um, I was especially attuned to progressive marketing ideas. I was always looking for something to do with Drawn and Quarterly. And I was looking at books for um, adaptation to graphic novels. Um, I was trying to expand my reading outside of my usual comics habits. Um, three novels being released in quick succession was um, a very exciting idea to me. I, I gobbled each book up as it came out. I had known Jeff's work beforehand, um, but like so many others, the first of those books, Annihilation, is where I became a fan. I was hooked. Jeff's description of the flora and fauna struck a deep chord in me. I was transported back to my childhood, wading through swamps and crawling through thickets for hours on end. And the prospect of nature reclaiming everything as civilization disappeared um, remains very alluring. I followed Jeff's social media, just like everyone here. And as I recall, around the time of the novel born, Jeff started showing and talking about Theo's art. Certainly there was Theo's drawing of Mord, um, but there must have been something else. I remember thinking at the time, of course. Theo makes perfect sense in Jeff's extended universe. If you just look at the cover to um, Theo's book, Understanding Monster, volume one, it's all there. There's a scaly humanoid beast, mystical eyes projecting the word monster. Um, there's a shadowy dread infiltrating the whole scene, but it's, it's not uh, dire. There's, a, there's sort of a, there's a, like a beauty in it too, of course. Um, <clears throat> Theo's drawings have an organic feel. Like very few other artists, his creatures look like they're about to crawl off the paper. So many lines, so much detail, his pictures vibrate. So many leaves, vines, grit, dirt, pebbles. It's overwhelming. Theo's drawings take over your mind. They reclaim your mental space in the same way um, as Jeff's prose. My memory is that Theo approached me about Secret Life. Um, this may be incorrect. My email was no help um, when I tried to figure this out. Theo saying he was going to adapt Jeff. Perfect. That makes sense. Really a perfect match. It's clear Jeff understands cartooning in a way that many writers don't. And it's clear that Theo understands Jeff's universe. There are many great teams in comics, of course, and I have no prob problem saying that Theo and Jeff are one of them. These guys are in sync. It's been a pleasure to see this book take shape. Um, and it's certainly a great pleasure to be here tonight introducing Jeff and Theo. Please buy everything that um, either of them has ever done. Um, you won't be disappointed, but specifically buy Secret Life, Secret Life. And please do buy from our amazing partner bookstores, Skylight Books in LA, The Beguiling in Toronto, Library d and in Montreal. And uh, we'll be sharing buy links in the chat on the side there. So gentle Zoomers, Jeff Vandermeer and Theo Ellsworth. <laughs> well, thank you, Tom, for that uh, absolutely wonderful uh, introduction. I really appreciate that. I know Theo probably does too. Uh, thanks to Theo uh, for, for um, well, for, for everything really. And uh, the bookstore is hosting, thanks to them as well. I, I do need to have a, sh a shout out to Sally Harding, uh, my agent who, who helped uh, make this book happen too in her way. And uh, thanks to everyone at Drawn and Corley who have been absolutely so amazing. It's such a dream come true for me to have a book adapted for DNQ. I mean, it's something that I actually have dreamed about. So it, it feels like I'm still in that dream in a very good way. And then I would just like to also add um, before, um, we continue that we went to Montreal after the Olympic, after the presidential election in 2016, uh, because we were feeling so down and Montreal kind of restored us and going to the drawn and quarterly uh, bookstore was one of the highlights of that. And, and one of the things that, 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 that helped a, a great deal. So I appreciate uh, it too, on, in that very personal way. So um, Theo, um, 
just to get right into it, um, can you recall how we met? Because I can't. I have this, in this pandemic fog, it feels like I have known you for a very long time. Is that true? Do you it know? It kind of seem like that. Um, I, I do kind of, well, I kind of remember, yeah. Um, well, I think you actually found my book, Capacity, at the Drama Quarterly Bookstore. That's right. Which oh made it all <laughs> extra fortuitous. <laughs> I had forgotten about that. Yes, you're right. Yeah. Wow. Um, and I think you you recommended it online. Um, and a good friend of mine, who's uh, who's kind of one of my super well-read friends, who's always recommending books to me, I um, uh, was friends with you on Facebook. So he wrote me saying, this great author is recommending your work. And if you haven't read the Southern Reese trilogy, you should. Um, so I wrote you just like a thank you and offered to send you some more of my self-published stuff. And then things just kind of happened from there. And then somehow I was making a giant woodcut for you to- A giant <laughs> woodcut? A, a giant woodcut, you say? Was it, was yeah. it this <laughs> giant woodcut that you were making? <laughs> that, that, I was, that I was carting around to 17 different cities? <laughs> I know, I, I have to say, I felt, I felt really guilty while you were on your tour. So I suddenly realized like, I gave Jeff a giant plank of wood that he has to now <laughs> carry with him around. The <laughs> and, and yet that, that, you know, being, you know, having to lug that everywhere really kind of, you know, I, I kind of imprinted on you, Theo. I kind of imprinted on your work that way. <laughs> and it led to this amazing project. Um, yeah, no, so I... that's another thing is um, my memory must just be feel, failing me in my old age because how did we end up here? Because in my mind, and I know this is not how it happened, I sent you the story and I heard nothing for several months. And then suddenly I got like 96 pages of amazing work. <laughs> That's not how it happened, is it? Uh, not, not quite, at least not in my, <laughs> not in my alternate universe version of it. <laughs> well, it, I mean, well, you sent me the story and immediately somehow it just started unpacking itself in my head. Like I could see how I would turn it into a comic. Um, uh, and initially I drew eight pages mm -hmm. and then it kind That's of, right. uh, and then I think you gave it to Sally Harding. Um, and then I think months went by mm. and you guys came back wanting 20 pages. So I drew the, so I got to 20 pages and then there was kind of like a year, at least a year gap where they kind of had to go through all the different, uh, you know, different publishers and stuff. Um, and in the back of my head, I just kept thinking, like, Drawn and Quarterly is the perfect publisher. Like, I hope that's where it goes. Yes. And then it all magically <laughs> sort of lined up. And then, I mean, it was a while before it felt like it was go time, where it was like, this is happening and you're going to do this. Yeah. And then once I sat down, I just felt like it. I thought about the story so much that the pages just flowed. Yeah, it would have been actually quite cruel if it hadn't wound up with D&Q given all the other other synchronicities with regard to that. Um, two questions. Was there any particular image or thing in the story that, that initially like clicked with you? And also, was the process very different from your usual process? Have you collaborated in this way before? And by collaborate, I mean, take someone's story and just like do everything, do amazing things with it, and then it's done. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't um, have to do anything. I don't have to write a script. I don't have to do anything. <laughs> I mean, that was a really fun way to work. I, I've, I've never done anything like that before. And I felt like it, um, I don't know, like it opened up this weird hidden box in my brain that I didn't know. I didn't know I could work that way. I mean, at, at the time, I wasn't even like, I wasn't even drawing humans really in my work. <laughs> like I was, I was mostly, uh, um, you know, doing, doing illustration work and gallery stuff and drawing these kind of like multi-layered creatures and um, I mean, so much, so much of my work is naturally inward facing. I feel like I'm going directly into my subconscious and uh, just it feels like this wild space that I'm trying to navigate. Um, and because of that, like the comics, like I just kept hitting walls with my comics. Like uh, I was trying, I've been trying to work on this big project and it just kept on feeling like this jungle, like it would branch in every direction. Um, and then I'd have to get back to illustration work to make rent. Um, so your, your story felt like this 
transmission from the outside world, like mm -hmm. something that I could, like this weird puzzle box I could open and unpack and suddenly, suddenly I could just see it. It, it, it allowed me to subvert all the, um, all the weird hangups I was having mm -hmm. with my own graphic novel. Mm -hmm. um, and it just, I don't know, it just made sense. That's cool. So um, you said in an interview, uh, well, for Wonderbook actually, that a hand can be a delicate instrument of detection. Uh, and that made me curious about how inspiration uh, comes to you. Does it come to you literally in the act of drawing or do you conceptualize in your head first? How exactly does that work for you? Um, yeah, I mean, I really feel like the act of drawing is sort of an extension of my thoughts or it helps me think clearly when I draw which is why it naturally ends up having so much, uh, so many patterns and textures, because mm -hmm. that's the act of doing that is what kind of puts me into that mm -hmm. state. Um, so like the, um, like all the characters in the story, they're coming up with their faces, like just sitting and drawing allowed me to sort of feel or have this empathy where I could inhabit those characters and draw their portraits. Um, yeah, it's, I sort of lost track of what I was. Oh, no worries. <laughs> going with and, that. <laughs> and you were very, um, well, actually, question, do you ever not draw? I pretty much have to draw every day or else it's weird. I think I stop mm -hmm. knowing what to do with my hands if mm -hmm. I don't draw. Like mm -hmm. when I, when drawing, drawing became a really important uh, tool for me in high school. Like I feel like it was a channel for my nervous energy just to sit and doodle and then suddenly my mind would be clear and calm so it just became this like essential thing like I, if I don't draw I start feeling neurotic or something and mm -hmm. it kind of like evens me out or something <laughs> yeah no I understand I mean I I can go like a couple months without writing um like writing anything but that's about it uh -huh. Um, yeah. I think Twitter writing sometimes helps and sometimes yes. doesn't. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> um, but yeah, I totally get it. I, I get this itchy kind of, of this kind of restless feeling and I'm out of sorts. Um, but that that's pretty amazing. Um, you were also very faithful to the text of the Secret Life story, reproducing uh, most of it in the graphic novel. And I, I wondered, did you always intend to do that? And why did you decide to be that faithful to the text? Um. From the very beginning, I kind of had this, the only rule I really made for myself was that I could take away words, but not add words. Yeah. Like I wanted to, um, like anything that, that sort of got absorbed into the imagery, you know, I didn't want to repeat. Mm -hmm. So I, I kind of like, I mean, the, the process was I, I actually took a copy of your story and I cut it up with scissors and kind of spread the whole, that whole thing out. I felt like kind yeah. of an insane, ransom note writer <laughs> but uh that that allowed me to sort of pay attention to every comma and find just kind of find the the patterns and rhythms in the story um and that's how i would decide like how to divide it up and try to create that sense of pacing on the page i just i really wanted to lean into the um to making it feel like it, it had that same sort of pattern and flow of your story um so yeah i did um, so yeah, I, I only took away words, but didn't add anything. Mm -hmm. And then anything, um, that I did add had to be in the visuals. Um, I didn't want to like, you know, take a, any kind of crazy 180 turns and, uh, you know, add too much of my own stuff to it in that way. But like, uh, the stuff that I did add ended up being these visual elements that or like these connections that I ended up seeing inside of the story that kind of haunted me or just wouldn't, wouldn't let back. So those were the things I decided I had to pursue and bring into it. Yeah, and there are some uh, extended, I think the flow of time is a little different in the graphic novel, which is, I think, just a function of translation, but also uh, a function of that emphasis you're talking about, because there are some lovely completely wordless uh, set pieces uh, that, that I just adore that seem in keeping with the, the spirit of the story, um, but are so utterly yours at the same time. But one interesting thing I thought about the translation to graphic novel is how the art style has transformed the tone of the story. I mean, the story in parts is whimsical, in parts is 
is darker. And I was curious um, if after you finished the graphic novel, if you felt the same way that that it was the same story, but there was were tonal differences now that that certain things um, were like more grotesque, less grotesque and, and things like that because of the, the art style and everything. Um, yeah, definitely things I felt uh, like certain things naturally became emphasized or they were kind of like things kind of at the foggy edges of the story that I suddenly felt really focused on. Um, yeah, the, uh, I mean, I feel like the story itself brought out a totally different aspect of my style. I mean, I don't feel like I've ever drawn anything like this or worked this way before. Um, I tried to be more realistic with my art too. Yeah, and um, I think that the 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 intersection, for example, of of the story tone and the graphic novel tone, is exemplified by um, the the mimic part that's actually up on Orion magazine now that people can go see. Uh, uh, where I think that the grotesquerie of that section is the same in both the graphic novel and in the the original story. Um, mm -hmm. But I just find it really fascinating because I now can't read the story without seeing your visuals, and the story is transformed by rereading it in the text uh, with your visuals into like a third version for me. Uh, uh -huh. A lot of the different things. And it's actually kind of important because, you know, this story for me was based originally on emails that I sent to fellow employees when we changed office buildings, because we had a lot of time on our hands for like a week and nothing to do while they were moving stuff in. And so I sent these missives as if they were from different parts of the building. Um, and so I haven't actually been able to see the story until your graphic novel as a story separate from my experience in that building. Uh, mm -hmm. So that, that, that's a great, a great gift that you've given me. So um, I think it'd be a good place now for, for me to actually read a short section from the original short story. And then I think you have a slideshow of the same pages in the graphic novel so that the viewers can kind of see what the transformation was like. And I, yeah. I would just also say to the audience, uh, please remember to get your questions in uh, to the Q&A. Uh, so that I can access those at the end and 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 uh, give Theo some great questions. Now, the genesis of Secret Life is kind of interesting in that it started out actually as uh, a limited edition chapbook illustrated by uh, with flourishes by my friend Eric Schaller, then became uh, the title story of this collection. And then as a, a promotional thing, a separate book called Secret Lives was created where people who bought the book in a certain from a certain bookstore, I wrote them a secret life uh, that was kind wow. of based off of the story. So it's had several lives uh, since then. I'm going to read yeah. a, a section <laughs> called a, Con a Confusion of Tongues from the original uh, chapbook. So it may not even be the exact uh, text that Theo was working with, but it's very close. Um, this is just a couple of pages. Uh, once through a glitch in the system, an employee on the fifth floor was forgotten, but remained on the payroll. She had only one task to stamp approved on various documents. Several years before this job had required a full-time employee because so many documents had to be approved. However, that time had passed long ago. Now in an office on the opposite side of the building, Another employee rushed to stamp rejected on a mountain of documents. The order of such things might again reverse itself, but for now the woman spent her days in languid anticipation of the next document, which might not arrive for several hours. The woman did not even have a window to distract her. Mostly the woman read or listened to the radio. Late in the day, she might dance or even drink whiskey from a flask. She did these things at home in her apartment too, but they felt more daring at work. Tiny gray mice that poked their heads out of cracks at the base of the wall near her desk provided the only break in the monotony of her routine. The first time she saw a mouse, she gasped and lifted the receiver of her telephone. The janitorial staff did not like mice, but as the mouse wrinkled its nose scenting and sidled out into the office, she put the receiver down. There was no reason to call. She'd been acting out the role of someone who was not her. Instead, she took out the whiskey and poured herself a shot. It tasted crisp and burned her throat. Nothing this exciting had happened to her all day. As a child, she had spent summers on her grandparents' farm. She used to sleep outside, smelling clover, grass, and the thick earth. She would ride her horse for hours over the lush green countryside. 
Much to her grandfather's bewilderment, she had also tried to save mice from the half feral farm cats. The next day, the woman began to bring breadcrumbs, seeds, and other scraps from her apartment. She even went to the store to buy cheese. As many as 10 scruffy, nervous mice feasted on what she had brought in with her. Their quick, hesitant movements amused her. Their psychic abilities impressed her as well. They always disappeared at least 15 minutes before the courier arrived with the latest document to enjoy the stamp of approval. She found herself trying out names for the mice on a pad of paper. Charles, Lisa, Gwen, Jonathan, Diana, Bob. After a while, she sat in her office with the, without windows, waiting for the next document. She found herself listening to the chirping language of the mice as they bickered over a biscuit or a rind of cheese. The more she watched them as they spoke to each other, the more she began to understand the nuances of their speech. Once or twice, she lay on the floor and covered her arms with bits of crackers and seeds. The bristly feel of their whiskers, the softness of their noses, the delicate touch of their paws, all of this helped her to understand them. Several years passed. The woman's hair became flecked with gray. Her father and mother both died within a year of each other. The number of documents to be stamped neither increased nor decreased. Her entwined states of being friendless and alone were broken by infrequent periods of happiness that only made her feel worse when they ended abruptly. But she did learn the language of the mice. So well did she learn their language that she was able to teach them elements of her own language. This happened slowly and steadily, so that she almost did not notice the change, how the mice became her eyes and ears in other parts of the building, how they reported back to her on events and people that fascinated her. And because the viewpoint of a mouse is rather like a child, different and new and sparkling around the edges, their accounts were all the more entertaining and insightful. The woman let her hair grow long and did not bother to dye the gray out of it. She wore long patchwork shirts and slippers. She stopped drinking whiskey. She no longer even bothered to say hello to the infrequent courier. Instead, she found herself speaking more and more often through her mice. The voices of the mice become her vi voice. They spoke out in rustles and murmurs and chirps from the air ducts and the little holes in the vents and pipes, a dusty whisper that filled the building little by little until the custodians would look up in their jaded contemplation of the newspaper, struck by what seemed like a tongue of air in a place where no breeze ever blew. At least this is the story some inhabitants of the building tell to explain why at odd times on elevators in an empty hallway, voices can be heard speaking through the walls. Thanks, that Jeff. That's really, really great to hear. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> yeah, it feels like that story is almost like a dream I had. So it's weird to, to, for you to hear it that way. It <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it's lovely yeah. in a graphic novel. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah, I was just going to go through uh, those actual pages. Uh, now you've gotten to hear exactly what Jeff sent me and what I got to see. Uh, we can go to the first page. Um, this was actually the section of the book that I was the least sure about when, uh, when once I had read the whole story and was trying to internalize it all. Um, I couldn't picture this character and I, I really felt like, uh, I kind of felt like her or, the, or I felt like I'd had periods of my life where I've felt really quiet or almost transparent in that way. Um, and I initially wanted the reader to have to see through her eyes. So I was going to not show her at all and only show what she sees, but it wouldn't, it wouldn't really work because I'd be, just be drawing blank walls. Um, so I decided to treat it like a ghost story and sort of literally show how she feels. Um, okay, next slide. Um, so this, this is the one section of the book that has white space. Um, I kind of obsessively cross-hatched the, all the backgrounds to really like kind of create this claustrophobic sense of a building. But um, with her scenes, it, it felt like 
her room needed to be more abstract. So it's like her, her door and then her broken window and the planks of wood are kind of just these floating elements in the scenes. Um, and here's, here's the, the guy that, whose job it is to stamp rejected. Um, I really tried to like method act this guy's portrait, like really imagine what it would be like to be someone whose job is just to reject things constantly and how that kind of messes with his home life and his mental state. And then I just sat and drew that guy. I think that's who showed up. Um, can go to the next slide. Um, so with every, uh, every section of the book, I feel like um, it really worked nicely that the whole thing was set up as the series of short vignettes. And with every vignette, I tried to have a completely different pattern of the way the book flowed. And with, with this section, it's always going down either in groups of three or, or two or one. Um, I really enjoyed showing how uh, like the clouds end up inside of her and her sense of loneliness in the building. Um, and then showing her life at home, uh, showing the fact that she isn't invisible at home uh, because she's completely comfortable there. Um, next slide. Um, and then when she sees the mouse for the first time, suddenly her room becomes a solid space because there's suddenly a sense of importance or something different about her space that brings her kind of back into it. Um, I really loved drawing her sleeping outside um, and it kind of brought back this memory for me when I was drawing that of uh, when I was a kid deciding to sleep outside one night to see the full moon um, and waking up in the middle of the night um, to find a skunk curled up on me like a cat. Um, and then the, the scene uh, with her riding a horse, I decided was just had to be in her inside of her imagination. Uh, so you have to visualize that as a as the reader, not because horses are hard to draw. <laughs> uh, actually, I think it takes a special kind of gene that I don't have to draw horses very easily. So I was very happy to skip that. Um, but I, just, I really, with this book, just creating these these patterns of scenes and the way the um, the spreads interacted with each other was really gratifying for me. Uh, next slide. Um, and then uh, I really, I really enjoy like holding a, a scene, like the scene of the of the mice. It's always that same corner, um, creating like a. There's a lot of scenes throughout the book where I feel like I set up a camera somewhere, and then I revisit those scenes multiple times. Like when the building overgrows, I revisit all the establishing shots uh, from the beginning of the book. Um, and then drawing this courier was another one of those moments where I just really tried to visualize this guy that is just bored all the time and how that's kind of affected him. Um, okay, next slide. Um, I love that um, because it's a Jeff Vandermeer story, only the mice get names. <laughs> and, uh, um, and I also love that all of these mice are named after people that Jeff knows. Um, hopefully someday I'll get to meet someone and they'll tell me that they're one of the mice. Uh, next slide. Um, I really enjoyed this element of it. Um, the fact that her ghost-like appearance is like this emotional layer to her world or how, how she feels. Um, and this moment where the mice start eating crackers off of her arms is the first time she's actually a visible person within her office. She's so, um, it's, it's like the one thing that kind of brings her into the present. Um, drawing this portrait of her parents felt really important too, just really trying to visualize her parents and her life and her past. Like I feel like there's all these kind of corners to this character that I've 
really thought about and really inhabited. Uh, next slide. Um, and then trying to depict the way she com communicates with the mice was a really fun challenge. And I, I felt like this part kind of shows you that she really thinks of herself almost like a ghost in, in the real world because she's describing herself that way to the mice right there. Um, and then as the mice are telling her all about the different things in the building, they're really, um, I wanted to show different parts of the book inside of that. Um, and then you realize that she kind of gains a different kind of consciousness. She's almost like an omniscient author at this point because she knows everything that's happening in the building and she gets this expanded view of this space. Even though she's this isolated character, she's almost, she knows more than anyone because she's been taking in all this information and almost becomes like a new kind of human in a way, I feel like. Uh, next slide. And then here, uh, through the mice telling her about the building, um, she actually gets to know what goes on with the shadow cabinet. Like the, this mysterious thing happens with these masked beings in this room and no one knows about it. But I realized that she would get to find out. So we get this little glimpse of what happens in that room. So we, we see him vanishing in his tilted back chair on the floor. Um, and then the next part, it felt really satisfying to set up what happens with the mimic. So you get this glimpse of him attempting to look more human, but not, not quite passing as human. Um, and this last part, I, I really uh, enjoyed that, the, like thinking about the, the courier and his day-to-day -day monotony and how weird it would be to walk into a room to deliver something. And the woman just stands there with her back turned and doesn't say anything to him and how it kind of introduces this element of absurdity or surrealness into his life. And he's made uncomfortable, but a little less bored. Um, last slide. Um, and here, I just, I just really wanted to depict that, that feeling of uh, just the multi-leveled consciousness that she's kind of gained through her communication with the mice uh, and everything she knows and how that's kind of leaking through the walls and affecting the courier's world there. Um, so yeah, that's just kind of what, some of the things that I thought about while I was unpacking what Jeff just read. That's, uh, that's really, really cool. And I, I have to be honest, uh, <laughs> I did not realize that you returned to the establishing shots in the later scenes with the vine. Um, that oh, is yeah. really, really yeah. cool. Yeah, those um, first two pages where we show the different yeah. scenes of the that building. Is, I that is really those overgrown. <laughs> Yeah, no, that is really, really awesome. Um, I am a little disappointed because I thought our next project um, would be a, a book I'm working on called Horse World, uh, but clearly, clearly that's not not going to happen. Um, but <laughs> but I did want to point out I'll, about the I'll mice. Oh, really? Okay. <laughs> I want to get good at drawing horses. <laughs> <laughs> well, then maybe I, now I'm now I'm stuck. Now I'm going to have to do this Horse World. Yeah, thing. write, write um, me Horse World. <laughs> I'm gonna have to learn a lot about horses. Um, so you were kind enough to send, as one of your woodcuts, the page of the mice, which was just so so amazing to have this keepsake. So thank you again for this. And and I would oh, like yeah. to say, Pleasure. to report back that Terry and Myra, two of the mice, um, are are actually over the moon that they're mice. They didn't know they were going to be mice. <laughs> uh, I didn't ask them first, so there was that moment of uncertainty. But uh, but yeah. they 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 they're really psyched about it. So oh just, good. Yeah. <laughs> you never know who's going to be upset about finding out their amounts. Yeah, exactly. So um, given all the intricate planning, because it's quite clear, just, I mean, even the bit about the mimic and, and, and showing what happens with the suitcase people and all that kind of thing, uh, just shows a lot of intricate planning. And I'm curious, in that case, and, and talking about establishing shots and whatnot, did you have uh, any inspirations 
outside of your own art in terms of creating the graphic novel? Does, is that how you work uh, uh, ever or, or is it all sui generis? Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, I thought, I thought a lot about film and like cinematography, um, like, uh, like, like thinking about things from camera angles and pacing and stuff like that. I mean, I'm, I'm always, I'm always reading as much as I can and pouring over comics and other people's work, but I don't know if there's anything necessarily that really specifically, uh, helped kind of how I thought about this. Um, it was more just uh, really trying to digest the story and mm -hmm. see the way it naturally wanted to come out. And have you ever worked in a weird office building? Um, I was I was more like the um, night janitor in a funeral home type. <laughs> oh, <right. laughs> I was, I was very much from the from the janitor perspective on this. I think. Did, that, did that help at all? <laughs> yeah, you know, I I I know what it's like to yeah. be in a like a weird space in the middle of the night, cleaning up after people yeah. and imagining what occurred to make that specific mess. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, you so your your side of the story kind of came from the you know office work perspective, and I'm I was in the basement. <laughs> <laughs> and 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 um and and in a way, uh, and you got you got the um the upbeat part of the story because the non upbeat part of my office life experience uh, became something called the situation. Uh, which, which eventually led to uh, the whole uh, more giant bear uh, and everything else. Uh, so oh, there's wow. a weird there's a weird connection there too because Mord uh -huh. is in the situation in an office building uh, before he oh, becomes wow. a bear. He's a human, but he's he, he's he becomes a bear because of the situation in the office building. <laughs> and it is kind of a sequel in a weird way to Secret Life. They're totally unconnected, but at the same time, it's, it's and I And I started with Mord. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly. That's what, <laughs> there's just so many connections here. There's there's going to be a, a, a wall in the back here with all those red string lines that you oh, see yeah. in the police procedurals. <laughs> at the end I of always wanted thing. to make one of those. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You never come back from that, you know, but it's, it's cool to, to do one once. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, this is a very simple question, but, you know, again, with the interest see i wonder was there a part of secret life that was the most difficult for you to kind of like process translate um that you had to spend a lot of time thinking about or working on um well that i guess the the confusion of tongue section was mm -hmm. definitely the part i was i had no idea how how to depict it until i got to it mm -hmm. but uh i mean i just I read through it a couple of times and then I just started with page one and I would start and finish each page as I went, like I didn't work ahead. Um, and I felt like the act of drawing as I went sort of like prepared me for each part. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's one, I, can't, I, I wish I could remember what part it was, but there was one part where I just didn't know what to do, but I was clear about something a couple of pages down so I finished that first and then worked my way back. But for the most part, I just did it one page at a time. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't do any like uh, thumbnails or preliminary sketches. Like it mm -hmm. just all worked out right on the page. And I and I I drew it in. Uh, this is this is one of the portfolios. But yeah, using a portfolio awesome. to like build the book really helped because yeah. then I could mm -hmm. see like it was really important to know the page spreads. And I really liked having the pages kind of interact with each other. And, um, so just kind of, I just slowly built it into these portfolios and that's cool. problem solved as I went. And, um, you know, uh, we're going to go to audience questions very soon, but, uh, you know, I find your work even very surreal to be very comforting. Um, and, and, and sometimes the images, I guess, could be kind of considered horrific. But, and maybe I'm just too grounded in the weird, but I'm curious as to your intent in your work because it's, it's both so original and, and, and out there and wild and surreal. And yet, like I said, kind of comforting. And, and I'm curious if that's an effect you're going for. And I mean that as the highest compliment that it can be both these things at once seems almost impossible, but it is. 
Uh, well, I, I mean, I guess it is both of those things for me, like while I'm working. Mm -hmm. um, it's a super comforting thing. I mean, it's, it's this very central thing to my life that it feels like such a part of my identity that it, like if I ever stopped, something's very wrong with me. <laughs> um, so like the act of drawing is really comforting to me. Um, but it's all, it can also be startling or it brings me right up against stuff in my subconscious or like, it's a place where I feel like I work everything out. So I go through all kinds of emotions while I'm sitting and drawing and I just kind of let them sort of filter through me and observe them. Yeah. So it's a very, um, it's a very meditative and comforting process, but also, also definitely scary sometimes. <laughs> yeah. I feel like yeah. it, it brings up all kinds of things, but it's like the, it's this place where I can face it all and see it all mm -hmm. in a way that makes sense to me. Oh, it's, it's definitely startling. It, it's, I mean, in a way that it, there's just a, a freshness and sharpness to it. I mean, we have, as you know, we have several of your, your, your woodcut pieces and every time I look at one, I just, it's like, I'm seeing it for the first time. It's just such a lovely, uh, wonderful thing to have, have in the house. Um, so we're going to go to audience questions. Um, before that, um, I think you did say you might, you might have a question for me. If you don't, that's fine. But if you have a question for me, I'm happy to answer it. Or an accusation, or yeah, you know. okay. <laughs> I'll I'll email you the accusations. <laughs> okay, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess the main. I guess it wasn't. I don't. I guess it's not necessarily a question so much, but like, I really got the sense that writing that story was kind of a cathartic hmm. kind of experience. I guess because you were in that job that you probably didn't necessarily love, mm -hmm. and you're, you know. I mean, you, at the beginning, you sent me a photo of the actual building. And I tried to base <laughs> did, it off of that. So I know you were, I mean, you were working in this building and imagining it being overgrown and crumbling. Yeah. <laughs> so it, it felt like there was, a, uh, there was kind of a catharsis for you or like it sort of yeah. helped you. Yeah, um, I would say it definitely did. Um, the, um, the thing of it is, is I was, uh, the one thing I could never make sense of until I, I, I was a full-time writer was how much this the, the the irrational social interactions every day were actually kind of harmful to the kind of personality I am, uh, mm -hmm. and so I think partly on a subconscious level, writing stuff like this kind of like uh, helped helped me a little bit with that. Uh -huh. Like when I was in the office, I always thought, oh, I need to have these interactions, but a lot of times they were actually fairly harmful over time <laughs> and uh, uh and so also with a company that had started out as one thing and become something else uh, uh you know to to kind of do something and you know, it's also for the fellow employees at, at the beginning in those emails because you know at that point it was kind of harmless stuff that was happening so it was it was like mm -hmm. a good fun to send these emails but it was also helping us all kind of transition i i think in a way to this new situation we were in um, so yeah, definitely, I would say, I think a lot of the stuff I write is in some ways, if not therapy, then definitely a catharsis, uh, something that I'm working out in addition uh -huh. to what I'm trying to present to the reader. So we yeah. have a, um, and you can put your questions still in the Q&A because we have about 15 minutes for questions. Uh, Jeremy Zerfoss has a question. Theo, you have a real knack for interesting patterns and etching in your art style. What is your favorite technique to come up with these? Oh man, I mean, I, I just, I'm, it's all, it's all pen and ink. I, I've never, I mean, I've done a little bit of etching, but uh, yeah, I, I almost don't, I mean, I'm not really schooled enough to know what techniques I'm using. It's more just, uh, I love drawing patterns. <laughs> like I could just draw like grass and wood grain like all day and feel happy. There's just something about, um, just like fill, filling a space and having considered every inch of a piece of paper um, and gotten lost in it. That, that's, that's what I love. Um, and I love looking at, I mean, I love looking at etchings and old woodblock prints and anything that, um, you know, that, that the human hand is like put care into means a lot to me. And there's a question from uh, Colin Coulson. To what degree do you know what you're going to draw before you do it? And is there something that you get out of the um, repetitive nature of some of the drawings? 
Um, with this book, I, I mean, I would try to visualize each scene um, and then draw it, which is very, which is very different from how a lot of my art comes out, where I start drawing to find the image. Um, like with with my woodcuts, like the stuff I do for galleries, I'm just, I just start drawing and stuff will start forming, and it's, it almost feels like I'm slowly developing a photograph, but I don't know what it's going to be. Um, so in that way, I love that sense of discovery. Um, but then this felt like a very different way to go about it, um, to visualize a, a scene and then try to draw it. Um, there's always surprises in that and it never, I never try to make it look exactly like what I'm holding in my head. It's more like uh, what's gonna feel alive on the page, uh, feel like a living, breathing thing. Um, Speaking of which, there's a question from Michelle um, that both uh, you and I seem to have an interest in the post-human or animal or alien uh, worlds. And Michelle has read Capacity and Annihilation. Uh, Michelle's curious how each of us come to those interests in our lives. Like, how old were you? And is that interest philosophical or just merely sort of intuitive? Uh, Thea, if you want to answer. Oh, man. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> It just seems to be what constantly comes out, like what happens. Um, I mean, when I when drawing be first became like a really important thing for me, I I would just draw in straight sharpie and never know what was going to come out. And like, if I messed up someone's hand, I would turn it into a bird, you know. So it just mm. um, it just always felt like this kind of natural force, like creativity. It feels like this living sort of part of me that I have to meet halfway and then it starts showing me weird things. It feels like a very organic uh, kind of mysterious force I'm engaging with. And I just uh, try to lean into that and work with what comes out of that, which ends up naturally being kind of overgrown and wild, I guess. Yeah, no, it makes perfect sense. And and for me, it's kind of similarly intuitive or instinctual. Um, you know, I grew up in Fiji, which is literally a tropical paradise, just lushly overgrown. And then <clears throat> we moved back to Ithaca, New York for one horrible, stressful year. I mean, I like Ithaca now, but then coming back from Fiji and into the snow was absolute hell and moved to, to Florida as a result, which was similarly lush and everything. And uh, so I've never really known uh, much time when I wasn't surrounded by a lot of wildlife and a lot of vegetation. And um, I do think that with regard, to, and it just kind of comes naturally out of that. And then also feeling like climate crisis and the biosphere are intimately connected as subjects. Uh, but, you know, I would say with regard to secret life, that there is something about the vine because when I'm disconnected from nature, even more and more now, uh, you know, if I'm, if I'm away from it uh, for any length of time, I also get agitated the way I do when I don't write. So in a way, the vine in the building is, was probably my way of, of, bringing something of the outside world into the building for real in my head, you know? So mm -hmm. we also have a question from Matthew Cheney, um, a gentleman from New Hampshire. Uh, for Theo, is there a different uh, process or feeling for you when working on adapting someone else's story versus a plot and character of your own? Um, yeah, definitely. I mean, it, um, I mean, even though the story was from your imagination, it really it felt like the outside world to me. Like I was trying to draw characters that were real people. Um, and like the, um, my own graphic novel I'm working on right now is just so back into my subconscious that it's like completely, it's, it's a completely other kind of thing. It's like, I'm trying to navigate this uh, weird inside space and sort of, uh, you know, all the obstacles are my own neuroses I'm trying to wrestle with. Whereas um, working with your story, I felt like I was able to set aside certain things like that and just completely um, enjoy the craft of making comics. And yeah. Yeah. I think we have time for uh, two more questions and I'm going to be self-indulgent and answer one of the questions that's directed at, at me for real briefly. Uh, Theo mentioned that his work, uh, Brian Bell says, Theo mentioned that his work is largely directly from his subconscious. Does Jeff feel that he works in a similar way 
or does he have a fully formed narrative in his mind when he begins to write? As I get older, I get lazier and lazier. So I, I keep it mostly in my head until it's so fully formed that I do as little writing as possible. Um, so, you know, I've never plucked a story too late. I've plucked one too soon uh, in terms of beginning to write. And so uh, you know, just as I've been using note cards for questions tonight, I, I write down every little scrap that comes from my subconscious on a separate note card, and then I can sequence them at the point at which I'm beginning uh, a, a draft. And so I can reward my subconscious, but not really commit to the story until it's fully formed uh, in my head. And I truly do believe that there's a huge difference between what the imagine, imagination can organically give you and then the mechanical things you need to do with a story. And I, I wanna make sure that those two things uh, stay separate and stay what they're supposed to be. So uh, like I said, one more question, I think Tom's gonna to come back on for some final words. Um, where was it? Oh yeah, uh, from Jeremy Zerfoss again. To Theo again, you make those yearly creatures and I've seen these two and they're just so amazing oh, yeah. uh, using old garden material and crops. Have you made any or considered making any projects in regards to those? Um, I would like to. I, I'm always hoping other people <laughs> will make one. I guess for those who don't know, uh, I've got kind of a yearly uh, fall tradition where I, I made this, um, it's like a person shaped, uh, uh, it's, it's eight feet tall and it's this person shaped uh, wood structure that I uh, stake into the ground. Uh, and then I have friends all bring their, uh, their uh, garden waste to, to my house and we put it all on the creature. And he, he's got these big woodcut eyes. Uh, so he's this, this giant uh, monster that stands in our yard every fall. Um, and, uh, and then I kind of, I, I like to keep track of what all happens with them. Uh, all the deer in the neighborhood and squirrels and stuff all come up and will be hanging out. Uh, there was one time I came out the door and all these birds just burst out of his chest um so it's i don't know it's, it's a nice way to um yeah. bring about the the winter it's something for us to look forward to this fall on your social media i do something uh totally not similar i actually dress up as a monster around halloween it's, it's not nearly as inspirational it's just kind of horrifying uh on trail cam footage um so thank you so much Theo. it's been wonderful to get a chance to talk to you and to celebrate this book um, which displays such an um, amazing vision and, and talent from you. And I, I can't tell you how grateful I am to you um, for, for embarking on this adventure. And, and, and it's, just, it's just amazing. So thank you very much. And I, oh, I guess thank I, you. Yeah. It's, a, it's a huge pleasure to get to do that. I'm really happy it worked out. And yeah. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. <laughs> I think that's Tom's cue. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Jeff. It's great to talk to you. Yeah. <laughs> I am back. Thanks, thanks you guys. Um, it was uh, unbelievable to hear Theo describe that section of the book. Um, really kind of eye-opening. And um, I have to immediately go and reread it now. There was so much in there that I, you know, that I did not catch, of course. Um, so, so thank you, Jeff, as well. And um, I would like, we'd like to thank Skylight Books and The Beguiling and Library d &Q for partnering on this event and selling books. And again, the, um, the links should be in the chat. Um, and like to thank our own Julia Paul Miranda and Kaya Smith Blackburn for handling all the background technical stuff that made this all go off so well. Um, and thank you everybody who, who dialed in and watched. Um, we really appreciate it. And it was, it was great to see these guys talk. So um, <clears throat> thank you everyone. Have a good night. <laughs>